once your opportunity is open because it's what our community needed at the moment. And then the zero tolerance policy kicked in and then family separation started and then everything blew up. <laughs> so then we started seeing, uh, we went from having like 20 people coming through to volunteer to like 8,000 people wanting to volunteer. Mm. Um, and a lot of that is high school and college student interest as well. So as it is, like a lot of volunteer opportunities that we had set up were only for people that were 18 or older, could speak Spanish, could drive themselves everywhere, had like the entire day open, like a super flexible schedule. So it's like really specific requirements that they needed. Um, those volunteer opportunities still exist and I'll touch on some of them that uh, you guys would be eligible to be a part of. Um, but since we are noticing that there are more youth trying to get involved, uh, it's my job to kind of see like what our community needs, what our organization needs, and see how I can fit you guys into it, and also see how we can spread education through the rest of our community. Um, so I'm gonna start by going over just a little bit of information about Raices. So uh, our name is an acronym, kind of, it's missing a letter, but uh, it stands for Refugee and Immigration uh, Center for Education and Legal Services. It doesn't have an L in there, but it's, it's silent. <laughs> it's, it's in there. Um, and so uh, our name actually means roots in Spanish. Um, and so it, it's kind of fun because we're also a grassroots organization, so roots, grassroots, it's cute. <laughs> um, but essentially we started back in the 80s. Uh, there was a couple living here in San Antonio who saw like how there's floods of immigrants coming to uh, the United States from Central America. They were escaping uh, civil wars that were happening there. Um, so it was more of a humanitarian reaction at first, so they, they got people together to help out these immigrants, but after assessing the needs of these people, they noticed that the number one need they had was legal services. So legal services to help them uh, continue living in the United States uh, safely and legally. Um, so we officially began in 1986, we became an official organization in 87. Now we are the largest immigration nonprofit in Texas, uh, we have three offices here in San Antonio, soon to be four, um, and that's just because our programs keep growing, so we need more space for our employees and our clients. Um, but we also have offices uh, elsewhere in Texas, so we have offices in Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Corpus Christi, and we just opened one up in Houston. So it's really exciting. Uh, those other offices mainly focus on legal services only, but we're starting to incorporate education and outreach into the other offices as well. Um, what makes us like really unique compared to other organizations like us is that we couple in a lot of advocacy and activism into what we do. So as an organization, we focus on a couple different categories, but ultimately we want to envision a future where um, there's policy and systems in place where people don't have to rely on us anymore. We want to imagine a future where everything is just and everything is fair, so people don't have to have this assistance to guide them through a, a broken system. Um, last year we closed around 51,000 cases, uh, and that's, I think that number is representative of the number of free cases we covered. So our main focus is providing low bono, which is like low cost, and free legal services to undocumented unaccompanied minors, families, which are women and children, and individual adult males in detention. In addition to doing all of that, we also do refugee resettlement services, and like I said, the advocacy and activism which takes shape in like volunteer opportunities, internship opportunities, and other outreach opportunities. Uh, a really important mile marker for us most recently is that we, uh, since the beginning of the year, we hit uh, our $1 million mark in bond payments. And bonds are what uh, detainees have to pay in order to get out of detention. And we released almost 150 people with mm. that $1 million. So some of you may have actually heard of us before, possibly from a, uh, Facebook fundraiser that went pretty viral. Um, there was a couple uh, at the beginning of the year, I think it was, they started this fundraiser just for one bond payment for one person of $1,500. And then more people started donating and it started growing mm -hmm. and it went from $1,500 to $25 million. <laughs> so now we have this huge bond fund, which is awesome because that means we can help out way more people that are in detention right now. Um, and our focus is on family separation. So we're, we're trying to get people out of detention to reunify them with their, their children. Um, not only mothers that have been separated from their kids, but fathers as well. Mm. So like I said, we do uh, a couple different categories of work, all for one cause. 
Um, we do community immigration services, which is actually taking place in our North Florida's office, one of our offices here in town. Um, essentially, anyone in the community can go in and seek a low cost or free consultation about anything concerning their immigration status. Uh, so that includes things like uh, DACA application renewal, things like that, as well as if you're undocumented and you're stuck in a, 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 a situation with, of do domestic violence or anything, that can be a really tricky um, case to go about, so our lawyers are there to assist those people. Um, we, like I said, we also provide services to, de to detain children, families, and other individuals, the education outreach, and the policy and advocacy. So um, one thing that is a like, big misconception by people in terms of immigration who's actually coming to our country is this idea that people are coming here illegally. Um, we're not saying that that doesn't happen, but a majority of people that do come here to the country, they are asylum seekers. So what that means is that they uh, come to a checkpoint on our border and they basically go up to, to our, our border patrol, ICE agents, et cetera, and they say, hey, I can't go back to my home country because I'm literally scared for my life, scared for my children's lives. Um, they can't go back. They, they're, they're so scared of the conditions or the situation that they have back there that they need to come to the United States. And so the timeline that follows that check-in is this. So once they're at the border and they request asylum, what they're, what's done then is that they're put into a little like stone room that's like a, what they nickname a cooler um, and it usually is about 30 degrees colder than whatever the temperature is outside. All the families are given are just like little foil emergency blankets. And while they're waiting there, their initial processing is kind of happening. So the family members are given A numbers, which stands for alien number, but we don't call them alien numbers because that's extremely dehumanizing to a person to call them an alien. So we avoid that word at all costs. Um, so after being in this little stone room, um, this is typically what families experience. A adult males usually go through the process a little bit faster because there's also way more detention centers for them. There's not as many detention centers for families. Um, after being in the stone room, they're transferred to another holding area that's kind of like a dog pound. It's another nickname. Uh, there's these big fenced-in rooms where there's only benches, no privacy, nothing like that. And again, they're still only given like basic little foil blankets. Um, after going through all their processing, they're finally put into family detention. Um, so one thing to know about detention is that there are detention centers for adult males, there are detention centers for adult females, and then there's detention centers for children, um, which are run in a separate department of the U.S. government. Um, so all the detention centers you guys hear about are probably uh, Department of Homeland Security, and then the other one is ran by entirely different departments, so they don't really even communicate with one another. Um, and then there's family detention, where mothers and children can be detained together. Um, there's only three family detention centers in the entire United States, and two of them exist here in Texas, not very far from us. The closest one is maybe like an hour away from us. Um, so while they're there, what's happening is that asylum seekers, when they come to the country and they want to stay here, they have to first pass what is called a credible fear interview. And so essentially what they do is they sit across the table from an asylum agent and they have to kind of revisit all of the trauma they've already gone through uh, just to justify why they deserve to live here. Um, and so sometimes uh, people that have already gone through the process up to this point, the credible fear interview, they've already gone through so much and it's gonna be really hard for them to revisit everything to prove why they should just stay here and seek safety. Um, so we actually have volunteer lawyers, like pro bono lawyers that come from all across the country to come to our detention centers and kind of help people be advocates for themselves. They go visit them and talk to them how, how they can talk about their own experiences in order to pass their credible fear interview and get reunified with their children and live here in the United States. Um, so after they go through the credible fear interview, the process is pretty subjective, meaning that the asylum agents don't really have like specific criteria to go off of when they, whenever deciding whether or not someone passes it. So if they decide they pass, then uh, the family can be released. Uh, they can only be released if they have a sponsor outside of detention. So a sponsor isn't like someone who funds them, but it's like a family member that lives here in the United States already that is willing to take them in for the time 
Um, after that, after they find a sponsor and they're released, uh, ICE agents either give them a bus ticket, plane ticket, or no ticket at all, and drops them off at a bus station, an airport, et cetera, depending on where you're coming from. Here in San Antonio, the two centers that are nearby us, they, uh, they drop them off at the Greyhound station here downtown. Uh, one thing to note about that is that ICE agents don't prepare them for like what the next steps are. So they don't really sit down with detainees and say, okay, once you're released, this is what you have to follow. These are the steps you need to take in order to like legally stay here. Nothing like that. No resources, nothing. So um, when they get to the bus station, they're usually like pretty confused. Um, don't know really what's going on some and, and as it is like it's already a really sensitive situation so they're not really open to asking for help because they don't want to single themselves out uh, they don't want to be embarrassed etc um, so we actually have volunteers that go down there and provide services to these people um, so another thing to note is that a majority of our clients come from the Northern Triangle which are three countries uh, El Salvador Honduras and Guatemala and these are the most dangerous countries to live in. Um, the, there's abundant uh, gang violence, uh, domestic violence, and what we've, what we've seen recently is a huge spike in femicide, which is murder specifically uh, dealing with women. And that's just something to keep in mind because some people don't really understand the situations that uh, immigrants come from, and they, they really are like fleeing for their lives. Um, um, so what can we do at Raices? Like I said, our main focus is legal services, um, and we're not all lawyers, so it's kind of hard to help out that way, but there's other opportunities to get involved. So um, here are two volunteer opportunities that have been happening uh, on a regular basis. So the bus station project, um, that's the, the volunteers that go to the downtown bus station and greet the families. Uh, like I said at the beginning, there's kind of like some specific requirements to be a volunteer. Uh, for this one, you have to be 18 or older and you have to speak Spanish and you have to have a way of getting to the bus station yourself. Uh, we don't really have ca the capacity to uh, transport volunteers right now. Um, but essentially what you do, you're trained to kind of like spot the families that get dropped off by ICE agents and you kind of go up to them and greet them and say, hey, are, are you coming from a detention center? Are you coming from this city? Because usually whenever you say Carnes or Dilly, they know that you're talking about the detention center. Um, and if they're willing to talk to you, that's when you can start asking them if they know what their next steps are, if they know who to contact, etc. So our volunteers literally walk them through all of their rights. Um, undocumented people do have rights in this country. Um, and then they also talk them through like the different resources that they can reach out to whenever they get to where they're going. So people uh, start their journey here in San Antonio and they end up all around the United States. Um, so that happens pretty much on a daily basis, Monday through Friday. We have two shifts already set up, like around breakfast time and lunch time. Um, but uh, immigrants get dropped off all throughout the day, uh, even at night and on the weekends. So we're looking at expanding our programming to fit all the time so we're not really missing anyone when they come through. Uh, there's also like a ton of little kids, so it's a really fun volunteer opportunity if you speak Spanish and want to go out there. Um, the kids love to play around and like use the vending machines and stuff. <laughs> it's really cute. Um, another option we have is accompaniment. And this is the one where you need a pretty flexible schedule because accompaniment, uh, you're essentially going with a client to an ICE check-in or an ankle monitor check-in. Um, and it can take a long time depending on how ICE wants to handle it that day. Uh, usually appointments are scheduled for the mornings. Uh, and what we notice is that when our clients go by themselves, sometimes they can be mistreated, they can be talked down to, they can be yelled at, they can be completely ignored. Uh, but for some reason when we have a volunteer with them, they're treated much better and the process goes by much smoother. Um, especially if you like dress up and you look kind of like a lawyer, they like treat you super nice. Um, <laughs> but it's really nice because as it is, uh, our clients are very scared about their situation every single day. So going in for an ICE check-in is even scarier because you don't necessarily know what could happen. And uh, to be treated poorly while trying to do the right thing isn't very fair and it, it isn't right for them and it could deter them from going back and violating uh, the process that they have to follow. So um, 
being a volunteer with them, you don't have to speak Spanish or, any, or anything, but just being with them um, means a lot to the client and means a lot to us. And this is an opportunity that I think we're trying to expand in different ways too, uh, in terms of like helping parents enroll their students in, in the school, um, which um, undocumented people can go to school. Uh, schools are legally uh, bound to allow undocumented students into um, in, to enroll. Um, but yeah. So, uh, like I said at the beginning, there hasn't been a whole lot of volunteer opportunities for youth specifically, so we're still trying to figure out how that really looks. But for right now, there are different ways to get involved. Um, so one way to get involved is being a Know Your Rights presenter. Um, so Know Your Rights is just a uh, presentation that we give to people. You don't have to be undocumented. It's geared towards undocumented people, but it's really good for allies to know and really good for like just being a US citizen to know. Uh, and essentially what we go over is like your rights in terms of when you're approached by law enforcement or by ICE. So you're not legally uh, uh, bound to like respond to them or let them into your home or your, your place of business or your school or anything unless they have a official warrant signed by a judge that has your name and your contact information on it. Um, you don't have to interact with them. You can stay silent. And a lot of undocumented people don't know that. Um, so they kind of like give up their rights whenever they do comply uh, and they don't actually have to. Um, so in terms of volunteering, there's opportunity for us as staff to come train you guys on how to give these presentations and then you can go into the community either on our behalf or just on your own and give presentations to your class, give presentations to your community members, all that good stuff. Um, and that counts as volunteer hours with us. Uh, another way to help out is collaborating with us on fundraising events or donation drives. Um, like I said earlier, we had a viral Facebook uh, fundraiser go, go around $25 million. That's a lot of money. But that money is specifically for our bond payments. So we can't use that for anything else that we do. Um, so one thing, uh, a good example right now that we're like fundraising specifically for our DACA renewals. So if you uh, guys don't keep up with like what's happening with DACA right now, it's kind of in limbo. So like the current administration wanted to get rid of it. And then the judge was like, no, let's keep it. And then all these other people were like, no, we have to get rid of it. And now judges are like, maybe we'll keep it. So it's kind of like back and forth. We don't really know what's happening. We don't know what the future of it looks like. Um, as it is right now, they're not accepting new applications, but they are allowing people to renew their applications. But that costs money. So a renewal of a DACA application actually costs $495. And that can be hard to come by for some people if they uh, are scared to work because they're undocumented if they have been refused job opportunities because they're undocumented, or if they're full-time students trying to get through school and don't have time to work. Um, so what we're noticing now, we used to have funds available for people to help them renew their, their DACA applications, and we would have clinics to do that, but we have really low turnout right now, and we're thinking it's because we're low on, like we don't have any financial assistance for people. So what we're trying to do now is set up fundraising events with uh, student groups and other community groups to see how we can raise those $495 fees uh, for students and others to come out and renew their DACAs. So after fundraising for something specific, then we can uh, coordinate like another event where you actually like deliver your donations or you see your funds being put to use. So if you're fundraising for DACA renewals, then we can coordinate a DACA clinic on your campus or in a community space and uh, get that information out and get people to come out and renew their DACAs. Um, so those are some opportunities. Other things are like on-campus on discussions and workshops. A really important part of uh, getting involved with nonprofits is recognizing the, the, the root issues that they are covering and dealing with. Um, and so we think it's extremely important for youth specifically to experience that, because volunteering is great, it really is. You're out there helping and stuff, but it's kind of temporary. You're there for a few hours and then you're done. So we wanna make sure that maybe there's more education 
uh, put into this. So we are available as staff to come onto your campus and lead discussions with you or workshops with you on topics about immigration or topics that relate to it. Uh, a lot of people tend to think of like social justice issues as like their own little categories, but there's a ton of intersectionality between all these topics and immigration is definitely one, one of them. Um, so if you're ever interested in learning more about immigration in general, immigration and intersectionality, uh, social media and activism, uh, learning more about your, your rights as a student in terms of like protesting and activism on campus, we can lead workshops and discussions about that with you guys. And that counts as volunteer hours as well with us. We believe that when you actually come out here and like dedicate time to learning more about this stuff, you're volunteering to be an advocate for us and the community that we serve. So those are some ways to get involved. Um, these are kind of like general things to go over as like volunteers. I think that they're kind of common sense, but we gotta go over them. Um, so dues, I mean, be, be a cool person, be nice, <laughs> help out when, when we need you and stuff. Uh, ask questions if you have them. Um, and sometimes because of the nature of our work, Sometimes suspicious or concerning activity happens and we need volunteers to report that immediately. Uh, that could be anywhere from like a stranger, like like taking pictures of you helping out one of our clients to uh, like we're throwing an event and there's uh, and then the police show up or something, but they're just hanging out. Um, as an organization, we tend to shy away from getting police involved with our events in terms of like just being like security and stuff because uh, we've noticed that uh, our, the community that we serve, it sometimes makes them uncomfortable. So we try to keep them, um, they're there, but they're not directly at our event. So if they're hanging out and stuff, we need like someone to tell us, because we didn't invite them. Um, don't, uh, don't share pictures or names or stories of the people that you work with if you do volunteer with us. You can share general information about the organization and like maybe what you did for the day. Um, but I mean, they're, they're human beings, they're, they're people too, and they've just gone through like traumatic events, so um, they don't always want their story publicized on, on a big platform for everyone to see. Um, the only instance that that happens is if our media team specifically requests for that, um, and, and the person we're working with is also okay with giving their testimonial out. Um, don't ask strangers to help out. So if you're volunteering at an event or you're volunteering at the bus station, don't ask like a stranger next to the person you're talking to to help them. Uh, we don't know them, they haven't been trained. Uh, we don't know if we can trust them. Um, and then lastly, even though we focus on providing legal services, uh, our volunteers, uh, besides our like pro bono lawyers, uh, we're not lawyers, so we can't give legal advice because we're not certified to do so. Um, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. You guys are lawyers? No. Okay. okay. So to register as a volunteer, uh, it's really easy. You just got to go to our website and go up to a little tab that says Take Action, and then click Volunteer Sign Up. You fill out a little sign-up sheet on the side of the page, um, and that gets you enrolled into our volunteer management system, uh, where we will send you newsletters and contact you about specific opportunities that relate to the things that you indicate you're interested in. So if today you heard me talk about bus station and accompaniment, um, and you sign up as a volunteer and you want to do those things specifically, put them in the extra notes part so we know to like contact you about those things. Um, same thing with like fundraising and things like that. You can put that in the extra notes part, and and I can contact you about those things. Um, group volunteering and stuff. I know in college, as a former college student myself, I understand that there are clubs and organizations that like have like ten people that want to go volunteer, um, or or like you you're part of a sorority and you have like philanthropy and stuff and you want to like be able to interact, volunteer, fundraise, etc. Um, for group volunteering involvement, there's a lot more work that has to go into it because we have to figure out how like ten people can help us at one time. So we just ask that you fill out a form that we created to give us more information. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can email that email, volunteer at readiesistexas.org, pretty simple. Uh, and that gives us more information about how many people to expect, when to expect you, what you're interested in learning more about, all the good stuff. Um, besides volunteering, uh, advocacy takes shape in many different ways, one of them being social media. Um, 
And social media is great. You guys should share stories, follow us on there, learn more about what we do and everything. Uh, but you should also do something in person because <laughs> it's good to like to be virtual advocates and stuff, but we also need people on the ground doing work too. So those are all of our handles for social media. Uh, feel free to give us a follow. Any questions? Well, another added thing I wanted to talk about, um, since this is pretty new and we, we are looking at how to get youth more involved, we are also noticing that uh, there's so much potential and power in youth voice. Um, and we wanna make sure that as an organization that has a really prominent presence on topics like this, that we're also giving skills to youth that are interested in these things to become better community leaders, political leaders, advocates in the future as well. So one thing we're looking at creating is a uh, kind of like an advocacy boot camp kind of thing, but all youth led. So uh, we're in the process of brainstorming with other San Antonio youth to learn more about like what they're interested in learning more about uh, in terms of leadership skills, advocacy, policy, etc. cetera. Um, and then we're gonna design some kind of program around that to help people become better leaders for whatever you believe in, not just immigration, but all those intersecting topics as well. So uh, in order to help us out with like figuring out what youth, uh, and when I say youth, I mean like 13 to 24 year olds, what they're interested in. Um, <laughs> it's like a bird that just, just flew into the window. <laughs> um, to help us out with like figuring out what you guys like and are interested in, I have a little survey set up over here. If you don't mind taking a few minutes to fill it out, uh, that'll also give me your email information uh, just in case you're interested in future volunteer opportunities. Uh, and more. Um, another plug-in is internships. We have them every single semester, fall, spring, and summer. Um, we have them in different departments. We have development, so helping out with money and stuff. Uh, we have community outreach, which is me. <laughs> um, we have uh, post-release, so you'd be working with like our bus station project um, and other post-release um, duties, I guess. Uh, we have um, we have a, a project research one, which is a little more, it's a little different, it's like a build your own adventure internship. You kind of like come to us about what you're interested in, what your skills are, um, and see how you could possibly help us out with research in one area or another. Um, and then we have um, a refugee resettlement internship, where you almost get the experience of working more like a case manager for the families that come through our services. Uh, and then we have legal internships. Uh, I know you guys aren't lawyers or law students, but if you ever become one in the future, uh, you can work with our community immigration services or our children's program. And if you're interested in those, you can talk to me right now or um, shoot an email to the volunteer email and I can forward you information. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy.